This is Raiders of the Lost Arts, and I appreciate it that you are here because I'm the last talk between you and lunch. And to make things interesting, I'd like to start with a disclaimer, which just doesn't really work because why should technology work when you want it to work? Better. I'm not a lawyer. I feel like I shouldn't need to tell you that because if you look here and think, that must be a lawyer, then seriously, what's wrong with you? This is not legal advice. I don't want to encourage you to do the things mentioned in this talk. I want you to know about them, and I take no responsibility if you do anything with it. The question then is, why am I giving this talk, and why am I having these shitty AI-created graphics that Jacob was talking about earlier. Oh, very easy. This is a local stable diffusion, which helped me with the pictures. I made this talk not just to rant about stuff that we haven't fixed in all the years, but also to make you aware that there are stuff uh, and, and things that you can do to a company to waste its resources without even touching a computer. And some of the risks I'm addressing are things that people think are not worth thinking about. I've heard more than once that, yeah, 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 but when we're breached internally, we've got a different set of problems. This is your different set of problems that you will have if you're breached internally. It's about old and ancient stuff. Those of you who have been around will probably know a lot of this, but you won't have seen the pictures. <laughs> um, that's one reason to stay. And before I start, usually my talks are concentrated, as mostly all talks, on attackers that are on the outside. I always like to start with placing the talk somewhere on, on that spectrum, because you can classify attackers in many, many ways. The way I like to do it is it how much skill do they have, are they someone who just has no idea? Or are they a nation-state attacker? And how likely is it that you are the target? Are you an innocent bystander because you're running a version of Windows that has been around for ages? Or you're running um, something more recent that has been breached and some attacker just hits everyone he can get? Or is someone specifically targeting your company and your company alone? Because if they do, you face different challenges than you do if you just didn't really patch your shit. And because I'm old, I would like to start with a few words about the early days. When this all started, the internet, the World Wide Web, trust was simply not an issue. You didn't have any reason not to trust the other party to be who they said they were. This was just not really a big thing from a purely technical point of view. Speed really was no issue. That thing is called an acoustic coupler where you had your telephone. The youngsters amongst you probably never have seen a telephone um, like that, but you, you put it on the acoustic coupler and then you could, you know, go to a mailbox with a fantastic speed of 300 bits per second. If maths is not your strong suit, it's not much. Speed was really not an issue. Crime also wasn't an issue for several reasons. Sure, there were defacements, there were hacks, there was stuff going on, especially because universities and others didn't really feel the need to secure their systems with firewalls and other stuff until about, well, let's say 10, 15 years ago. But crime was simply not an issue because there were no companies um, online and you can't do online crime if there are not a lot of companies that you can do crime against. And availability, again, also was not an issue. I remember two stories from back in the day. It was already the 2000s. But one of the former CEOs of the company I work for at the moment said very, very famously, we are using the internet, but we do not need it. 
Do you think this attitude has changed over the years? Of course it has. I also worked for a group of banks and our team managed everything, um, internet like DNS, proxies and the web server. And the common attitude was, well, we don't need to tell our clients if the web server is just down for two or three hours. Um, or if it goes down at the weekend, you don't need to come in. That has changed as well. Availability, uh, sorry, availability pretty much is very important right now. So everything changes and that is good. The really shitty thing is the underlying design doesn't really change or hasn't really changed. And there are ways how we, how people go on about doing about something like this. I found an interesting paper by uh, John Osterhut, and sorry for butchering that name, probably, about how it's time to replace TCP in the data center. Now, if you are um, familiar with networking, TCP is pretty much bread and butter of anything that runs. And the notion of replacing it in the data center or somewhere else for reasons that are good and sound in the paper um, meets the hard reality of cost. Because replacing network equipment just for to do something very new um, that hasn't been tested before, hopefully without anything failing or without downtime is something you can't across, get across to the board and you won't get budget for it. And if you doubt these words, then think back to IPv6. That has been around for I think something like 20 years now. And it's still pretty much not as well as adapted as some of us wished it to be years ago because there's cost and not a lot of um, economical outcome if we do it for the people who have the money. And the next thing is, unfortunately, security is always an afterthought. If we could build something and make it secure and say, we never have to touch the thing again because it's secure and nobody will hack it. We will have invented soup or something like that. Although once I, I tweeted um, that you can't hack soup, and of course I got um, a lot of people sending me links to videos how to hack soup, so maybe that's a bad example. These are all the RFCs that are just for DNS to address security issues with DNS since it was um, introduced in, in, in the 80s, I think. And all this stuff together, of course, makes Indy sad. But to spoil your appetite, of course it gets worse. On top of all these problems, we very much rely upon protocols that are unencrypted and unauthenticated by their very nature. And fortunately, most of them are not exposed to the internet, but some are. And I would like to highlight a few of them. I just said, you know, um, maybe you shouldn't run these protocols, but if you see the first contender, DNS, uh, you really can't run large-scale networks without DNS, or would you like to have a host file on every computer? Probably not. DNS as most of you will know, is very often attacked and successfully attacked. And if I'm within the same network, maybe I can spoof the DNS server. Maybe look at me, I'm the server now, um, and I can pretend to any user that I am the target server, get their traffic, and sniff it. Because DNS, as the other protocols are, are UDP protocols, are unauthenticated, and UDP means it's stateless unless TCP. So if I spoof my sending address, not my, take not my address, IP address on someone else's, I can have a lot of fun. For example, with syslog. Let me, well, I, I'll give you an example. I wish to serve a website that, well, it's just an example. I'm not really talking stuff here. I wish to um, examine a website that features people with not a lot of clothes on during my work hours, and I know it's being logged. 
So why don't I spoof the IP address to be that of my colleague, whom I absolutely not like, so that the syslog server in that case maybe has a proxy entry that's not coming from the proxy, but looks like a proxy entry and says, this IP address had a look at that web page. Syslog, as you all know, is something that collects logs on a Linux side. And again, I can send the syslog server usually anything, and it will just dutifully log that. The beauty of that is that this syslog server or the syslog servers in an organization usually talk on to CM systems like Splunk or any other systems. Um, and if you have a SOC or any computer emergency response team, they will have playbooks. And this playbook might say, if you get access to that, if these logs arrive in that order, in that amount of time, we need to act like this. So why not have a look? Why not see if they really go if you send the right amount of logs? Or maybe your company had a really bad incident a few months ago. Why not replay it? Be the Ernest Hemingway of syslogs. Be the Franz Kafka of syslogs. Do whatever you want. SNMP is the simple network management protocol. Again, a very useful idea where if you know the right communities, you can map networks, can see what it's all about, how they look like. Or if you know, uh, know the right community, then you can even write in these communities. Unfortunately, the communities usually are called public and private. And the unfortunate thing about that is, this is also the password you're using to access this community. So if you didn't rename your SNMP communities, you should do that. For SNMP, there are newer versions of the protocol available that give you a little bit more security. If you can, you should use them. TFTP is another contender. Again, good idea. I can upload or download files via UDP. It's faster. It's very often seen or has been seen with network equipment. There was one firewall vendor who famously allowed new image uploads via TFTP, which sounds good. There's a new version of the firewall software. You can upload it via TFTP. You don't have the FTP overhead. Cool. The problem was um, that vendor thought it would be a good idea that anybody could do that if they knew the right path. So if you wanted a new firewall image, then why not just upload it and wait until the firewall reboots? And the last on the list is NTP, the network time protocol. So 20 years ago, it was nice when the servers and the machines had roughly the same time and time zone. And nowadays, um, you can't really run stuff without having a very precise time because there's token expiry. There's a lot of things that depend on time. If you don't secure your NTP service, somebody could try to impersonate one on the straight of zero, which is the uppermost layer that has the correct time. And then you get a cascading failure because all those on the lower strata get the time from that server and it's just propagated throughout your network. Now you could go on and ask, well, um, is it a honeypot? Because I used to be a very great fan of honeypots. I still am. In the spirit of this presentation, frankly, who cares? Because you want to waste resources within the enterprise for whatever reasons, because you want to do something else or um, put attention elsewhere. If it's a honeypot, you are in luck because then higher paid people will look at your traffic and try to figure out what's going on. So, congrats. And as a general tip, what you could do against that, um, please, please think about ne network segmentation if you don't already do it. There's a good talk from the then CISO at Maersk, who were completely, um, completely overwhelmed by randomware, and randomware was able to encrypt everything because they had a flat network. If you're still operating on a flat network, please think about whether your users really need to send, for example, syslog messages or, or whatever, and uh, try to put some segments in. And some protocols allow for more security. Think about whether you can um, have that bit of more security without suffering 
too much in the convenience area. Now, if you're using that whole thing externally, then you're in another ballpark of pain because you have the same problems, but also UDP is a very good program uh, a protocol for amplification. Any DDoS attack, any attack that has a really big bandwidth deals with amplification, and that's, again, UDP. If I'm the attacker and spoof the originating IP address to be the one of the target, ask an NTP server for time, for example, the answer of that NTP server will go to the target, and it will be larger than my request. So NTP is maybe not the best example. It was one, but memcached is, in, to my knowledge, the one protocol that has the highest amplification factor. Um, it has one of, well, I send one byte, and for the one byte, my target gets how much? Does anybody like to guess? Nobody likes to guess because there's lunch outside. 51,000. So one byte gives me 51,000 bytes to the target. Of course, that is great. And that's just talking about technology. What I like to do even more is exploit human expectations. And this is very easy, and uh, you can get very creative with that. Years and years ago, a lot of talks, mine as well, featured the USB sticks that pen testers left at the parking lot and labeled them creatively like Bitcoin wallet, naked pictures, uh, finances, whatever, and hoped that somebody from the company would get them, plug them in, and they did have their back door. There's a study that this worked reasonably well years ago, and this example was so great that it made its way into every awareness training available. I'm pretty sure you probably have heard about that. And the nice thing about awareness trainings is, nowadays users do not plug in the USB stick. That's cool. They give that USB stick to the forensic department, which is even cooler. Because if you wrap a few bytes from Def Random in a, in a zip file, put some um, metric bytes in there, the forensics team, which is really expensive in terms of money, will spend a lot of time figuring out what the hell this is. But if this... I think we can all agree that the forensics team, those are poor guys anyway, but probably there are lawyers amongst us here in the room. Um, I even like wasting the time of lawyers more. How can you DDoS the legal department? And funnily enough, uh, I had a discussion with a lawyer at my company, and he gave me actually that idea for this. Because as a large company, we have a lot of websites out there. But there's no person who knows all the websites. Because we don't do them, them ourselves. Our company has about 8,000 people, and if some marketing department, anyone needs a website, they get the money, and they ask some marketing agency to put up, put up the website basically speaking, which is fine. But then you have lots and lots of websites, not on your servers, but somewhere on the internet, that legally belong to your company, but you have no idea who's responsible for them. So if you find those sites, there are legal issues with them, because they need, in Germany, they need an imprint, and they need to name the data protection officer. And now you get an LLM, and just let it write 100 letters, 200 letters, claiming that these websites have wrong information. It's the wrong DPO. The imprint isn't right. And so on and so forth. And again, these are just claims, but they look legitimate. And you send these letters per regular snail mail to that company. And the poor lawyers won't look at them today or tomorrow, but at some point, they will have to, because they will have to look at each single thing they get and try uh, and see whether this is a legitimate thing or not. And, well, we already talked about that nobody in the company knows whose website it is, so if you actually find legitimate things, um, they will have a hard time figuring that all out. I usually don't read from my slides, but this time I will read you some quotes. And I would like you just to take the quotes in and think about if you know co-workers who work like that. First one is, 
insist on doing everything through channels. Never permit shortcuts to be taken in order to expedite decisions. Make speeches. Talk as frequently as possible and at great length. I'm good at that. Illustrate your points by long anecdotes and accounts of personal experiences. When possible, refer to all matters to committees for further study and consideration. Attempt to make the committee as large as possible, never less than five. Last one. Bring up irrelevant issues as frequently as possible. Now, during COVID, I'm pretty sure each of you sometimes sat in a meeting where you met a person who fitted in one of these schemes. The fun thing about this is, this is not from the Department of Imagination Suppression or something. These quotes are directly taken and not changed from the Simple Sabotage Field Manual from um, the Office of Strategic Services in World War II. This was handed to occupied countries for people in the, uh, in the, the civil people so they could have some kind of resistance and sabotage things and make it harder for the occupier. Now, that's, that's a fun thought. Let, let us keep that in mind for a little bit. And another thing is just exploiting communications. If you do not know that building, you're excused. This is the Nuremberg Palace of Justice, and the Nuremberg trials were held there, and it's still a court of law. Why is that relevant? Well, you can't see it, but on the other side of the road is our main office. If they get a bomb threat, we get a bomb threat. Fortunately for us, our physical security team is really on top, and the one at the um, Palace of Justice as well, so they communicate well. And the Palace of Justice, every now and then, not, not really very often, but every now and then they get a bomb threat. And of course, everything in our company is closed down, depending on the expected blast radius, people might not be able to leave the building. And if they are allowed to leave the building, they usually do. So you will le lose revenue when the other building has a bomb threat. I'm not saying do bomb threats, but if you do a bomb threat, do not target the building you want to target, target a neighboring building. Chances are that unlike in this case, the level of security is different. One might have a very good level of security, the other might be shit. And then communications will really, really be difficult. So you make even more um, problems for people. Of course you shouldn't, and there are legal reasons for that, but I'm talking about other legal reasons. Um, you probably wouldn't raise your hand anyway, but I assume you have heard about ransomware. I would be interested if any one of you had ransomware in the company and decided to pay, but please come to me afterwards. Don't have to expose yourself. My point is, if you do that in Germany, you've got another problem. I don't know about Luxembourg law. I'm sorry, I'm, I'm really shitty at law. That's why I'm not a lawyer and so on. But in Germany, if you pay the ransom because you have been encrypted, and it doesn't matter whether you get decrypted or not, um, you're in legal trouble yourself because you supported a criminal enterprise. And then you have to prove to the court of law that unlocking your data is more beneficial to society than you being encrypted which is quite funny because basically if you pay, then you are screwed two ways. Lawyers can have real cases that lead them to trouble. There's one case I want to pick out. A woman in Austria thought it was a breach of her GDPR rights because the website she was surfing had Google Fonts and Google Fonts was not cached, but her IP address got transmitted to Google to download the Google fonts. This is quite stupid, but she made a case, her lawyer made a case, she wanted 190 euros from that um, website admin, and probably she would have gotten away with it if her lawyer and she herself did it with 10,000 different websites. And the judges rightfully said, I think, that it was not her intent to actually um, be protected by GDPR it was her pro um, intent to make money. So the lawyer is in legal trouble himself. What happens if you make up your cases? You're still into trouble. 
There was a really nice case, and I've got links at the end of the slides, and somewhere where you can download the slides with the links. Um, there was a funny thing this uh, earlier this year, where a lawyer thought he'd ask ChatGPT for references of cases like his to bolster his legal case. That was about um, somebody got, in, got an insured in an airplane, and ChatGPT never comes back and said, dude, I have no idea about that. ChatGPT just makes up things, as we all know. So he got back with a few cases that were in the favor of his client and handed them in. And the judge basically ripped him a new one because he didn't look the, the cases up. They were all non-existent. And the lawyer himself, again, has a lot of trouble. But I would also like to say that, of course, fuck-ups happen. Not every colleague that maybe does lengthy speeches or wants a committee is somebody out there to sabotage you. This picture is from 2018, Bastille Day in France. And obviously, the French flag hasn't changed. It's not a little bit red, a little bit more blue, and then white and red. But the first plane just had loaded the wrong color. This is something I really want to emphasize. I'm not here to um, spread fear, uncertainty, and doubt. On the contrary, I don't think a lot of people have the problem that they have somebody sabotaging them from within. But I would say, since it's really cheap to do, and a lot of companies are hiring, especially the large ones, and you can have a big impact if you are within those companies, have a look out for patterns like this. Even if they are not saboteurs, if somebody wants a committee for any decision um, that could be addressed. I would like to leave you with um, one suggestion from the sabotage field manual. Um, maybe you can relate to that. I'm German hacker. Um, I'm not the German hacker, because that's the mayor of a town close to where I live. He is Dr. German hacker. He's got a web page. Look him up. Um, I'm the one on the right here. I'm Stefan Hager, or K. And Brian gave me a lot of ideas for the talk. And the middle portrait is I asked the local stable diffusion instance to draw a few self portraits because it had so many lovely pictures. I know you probably didn't like them, but it's easier for me because they're royalty free. I work for a company called Datev, and if you want to know what we do, please come see me and talk to me. And the rest is basically just links. If you want to take a picture, please do it. Um, I would suggest wait two slides, because then I've got the link to where the slides are, and then you can click the links. Some image credits, and I'd like to thank you for your attention. If there are questions, I've got copies of the field manual. And if you've got a question, I've got three field manuals. When they're gone, they're gone. But questions. <laughs> and just to be clear, that's not the original. That's a reprint. <laughs> it might be that everybody just wants lunch. I see one. Hi, uh, thank you for the great presentation. I especially like the, the graphic design. It was wonderful and creepy at the same time. Thank you. <laughs> Is there any way to, I mean, any low tech way to target traditionally technological roles like system administration, non system administrators, and developers, and so on, so that you can? access their systems. Is there any way to make denial of service on them or? I don't know. Um, I don't know if I got the question correctly. Is there any way, low target way to take uh, target sysadmins? You explained how to DOS the law, law, yeah, uh, law yeah. department. Can you DOS or can you, you know, ah, somehow hack sysadmins? sysadmins? Hold a conference. <laughs> <laughs> um, Find something that is of interest to you, because if you have that question in mind, you've probably got a target in mind, and find out their interests. 
if there are overlapping interests, is this administration obviously, and maybe that would be an idea, have uh, ChatGPT or any LLM write a lot of blog posts about that and keep sending them to the sysadmins because they might look interesting, they might waste their time. Amazing, thanks. <laughs> Welcome. Um, come to me and get this thing. I do know the answer of hold the conference. At DEF CON they have spot the Fed. Sorry? At DEF CON they have a competition called spot the Fed. Yeah, spot the Fed. Any more questions? If you don't have questions, still when one of these comes to me. Right. With that, thank you, Kay. Thank you.